Hey, what up all my tooth doctors and doctresses? Welcome to another video at the Tooth Factory. Today we're going to continue with our prosthodontic second lecture on mandibular movements. So, before we begin the presentation, I do wish to explain the two pictures that are mentioned here to kind of get our interest rolling in the subject today. This entire image shows how the mandible, it was here, and now it's located here due to its working side movement towards the left. That makes the right side a non-working or a balancing side. Now, because this is moving to the left, we call this Bennett movement. And as a replication, this becomes a Bennett angle. Now, why is this important? Because it lets us know how we need to adjust, for example, a complete denture and its teeth arrangement and its interferences so that the teeth surfaces, the angles of the cusp, the occlusal plane, and everything can be adjusted to attain an occlusion that is favorable. So that's just a topic to kind of get our interest started. And this, again, is this is from the last lecture. It is the representation of how condyles only rotate on a transverse horizontal axis, which is also known as horizontal axis, or just an axis on which the condyles rotate and purely rotate only. Dr. Kanish has put together a perfect presentation to explain mandibular movements with very beautiful examples and pictures, and I, Rishi, will be presenting it to you. So today's lecture consists of introduction to mandibular movements. Again, we begin our prosthodontic lectures with terminologies. The glossary of prosthodontic terminologies is extremely important and moving on to temporal mandibular joint overviews and then TMJ mandibular movements. So this is static and this is in dynamic motion. Then we'll look at factors regulating mandibular movements. These are some things we'll discuss in much detail. Rotation, translation, excursion, border movements, functional and parafunctional habits and their movements as well as Bennett concepts and Christensen's concept as well as Pozelt's envelope and that kind of summarizes all the above points and of course the rules of occlusion to kind of summarize the entire chapter so we have a beautiful presentation coming up guys so get your notes and your pens out here we go important terminologies for this chapter centric relation okay so it's one of the most crucial concepts to discuss in prosthodontics however it is the diff one of the most difficult ones to remember when it comes to the definition however it is the maxillomandibular relationship in which the condyles will articulate at the thinnest avascular portion. So important line, thinnest avascular portion of what? Of their respective articular disc. So now we're talking about condyle articulating at the avascular portion of the articular discs with a complex in the anterior superior position. So it just lets you know where in the glenoid fossa the condyles actually attach against the slopes of the articular eminence again this is the articular eminence as we know and that's the slope anterior superior position the position is independent of tooth contact again centric relation has nothing to do with teeth so this position is clinically discernible when it comes to the mandible directing superior or anterior so when you move the mandible superior or anterior the slopes of the articular eminence tend to get into its contact it is restricted to purely rotatory movements about the transverse horizontal axis. Okay, that's a lot of words in here. However, our previous lecture on the prosthodontic one, the occlusal schemes, explains this concept very well. So please uh, check out that link in the description box below. And then we're moving on to eccentric relation. Also, don't worry, we will talk about centric relation in the diagram in the next slide. Uh, eccentric relation. Any relationship of the mandible to the maxilla that is not in centric relation. And that includes such as rotation, translation, protrusion, so on and forth, right? And we'll, of course, discuss them in detail. And what is transverse horizontal axis? This is an imaginary line that connects. It is around which the mandible may rotate within the sagittal plane. Also known as hinge axis. So this is where the two condyles on left right they connect horizontally and that's where all the rotation takes place 
but pure rotation. Physiologic rest position. It is the postural position of the mandible. When an individual is resting comfortably in an upright position and the associated muscles are in a state of minimal contractual activity. Okay, VDO is basically when the teeth are in maximum intercuspation and that's when we measure the length of the face. Okay, so it's when our teeth are occluding and we measure the length of the face. Whereas VDR is what we discussed up here. It is the vertical dimension of the face, or the length of the face, measured when the mandible is at rest position. So again, what was rest position? It was actually just the dropped jaw position. It's when our muscles of mastication are completely relaxed. Teeth not in contact. It's resting. Interocclusal rest space, or also known as freeway space. It is the distance between occluding surfaces of the maxilla and the mandibular teeth when the mandible in it is in its physiologic rest position. So basically, if your jaw is dropped, then the difference between your VDR and VDO is known as freeway space. That's all it means. And generally, as, as a demarcation, it's two to four millimeters of freeway space. Interocclusal distance. The distance between the occluding surfaces of the mandible, it's when the mandible is in a specified position. So interocclusal distance could be just anything. It could be uh, freeway space. It could be when the mouth is open or so on and forth. More definitions. How dry can this get, eh, guys? <laughs> Nevertheless, thank you for sticking with us, and we'll make sure it's worth your while. Maximal intercuspation position, MIP. It's the complete inter intercuspation, interocclusion of the opposing teeth independent of condylar position. So this has nothing to do with condyle movements. It is sometimes referred to as the best fit for teeth regardless of the condylar position, also known as maximum intercuspation. Basically, when your teeth are completely in biting position to the maximum of its capacity, doesn't matter where your condyle is. Christensen's phenomena, very, very important. Guys, the next two concepts are extremely important. Christensen's phenomena is the space that occurs between opposing occlusal surfaces during mandibular protrusion. Okay, that's very textbook. But what does it really mean? It means that when anteriors are protruding, so their anteriors are contacting, then there is a space created on posterior teeth. That's Christensen's phenomenon. All it's trying to say is that there's space created at the occlusal surfaces of the posterior teeth when mandible moves forward and anterior contact. So the disocclusion of the posterior teeth when there is an occlusion in the anterior teeth is Christensen's phenomenon. Bennett's angle. Bennett's angle is the angle formed between sagittal plane and the average path of advancing condyles. So we'll, okay, of course, we'll discuss this a lot more in detail, but it's an angle that is viewed in the horizontal plane during lateral mandibular movements. And its opposing partner on the working side is known as Bennett movement. So keep these definitions in mind because when we reach the end of the lecture, all of these will just become concepts that we grasp, not we have to memorize. Okay, guys? Excursive movements, we know what these are. Movements occurring when the mandible moves away from maximum intercuspation. Protrusion, retrusion, opening, and closing are just examples of excursive movements. And then comes the envelope of motion. It is a three-dimensional space circumscribed by mandibular border movements, which means the furthest mandible can move within which all unstrained mandibular movements occur. So we're not trying to strain the muscles. All the unstrained mandibular border movements are recorded by envelope of motion. So we'll also discuss that in the following slides. Moving on to early mandibular translation. <clears throat> Sorry, early mandibular translation. It is the early side shift, basically a translatory portion of the lateral movements in which the greatest portion occurs early in the forward movement of the non-working side condyle as it leaves the centric relation. Wow, what does all of that mean? We will again discuss this, but let me just shed some light on it right away. 
See, whenever there is a condyle, and I'm going to draw this from the superior view, so we all understand how mandible moves. So say this is the mandible with a terrible condyle. Anyways, it's moving to the left-hand side, okay? So what is early mandibular translation? It's saying the translatory portion of the lateral movement. So we define the lateral movement in which the greatest portion occurs early in forward movement of the non-working side. Okay, let's define that. It's moving left, so this becomes working. This becomes non-working. Forward movement in the non-working side of the condyle as it leaves the centric relation. Okay, so let's just imagine this mandible needs to move to the left. What will it do? Well, of course, the left condyle will only rotate, right? It doesn't have a lot of room. It'll only rotate to in order to move this mandible in this direction. But what will happen to this condyle? Well, of course, it will rotate for sure. But along with rotating, it will also move forward, slightly forward. Can we imagine that, guys? Imagine it's a video where this mandible is moving to the left, this area here is only rotating, whereas this area is rotating and translating. Is that, is that fair enough? Perfect. So early mandibular translation is this. Non-working, lateral movement, translation. Perfect. Progressive mandibular translation. Progressive side shift. The translatory portion of the mandibular movement Okay, we're still on the same chapter. As viewed in a specific body plane that occurs at a rate or amount that is directly proportional to the forward movement of the non-working condyle. Okay, so there are two types of translations. We just talked about early. And this one is progressive. So, of course, initially it moves, but when the mandible actually ends up here, in that case, the translation that would have occurred would have surpassed its initial trajectory. And that is progressive. Now, how important are these two definitions? Uh, not so much. So it's just important to know the concept of working, non-working, and the behavior of the condyles. Immediate mandibular lateral translation. Translatory portion of the lateral movement in which the non-working side of the condyle moves essentially straight and medially as it leaves CR. So this is just another way of explaining the same concept. Okay, here's the TMG anatomy from our previous lecture. Just to be clear, the centric relation is actually here. Okay, I want to clarify that because it's very important to identify centric relation at this point in the lecture. See how this is our condyle? And the blue shaded area is our articular disc okay it has a vascular portion here and an avascular portion here okay fair enough i'm going to erase that and i'll explain this in a different way when the condyle is in the most posterior so most posterior or retruded okay and when the superior and anterior portion connects with the art slopes of the articular eminence, slopes of the articular eminence, at the thinnest avascular portion of the articular disc, that position becomes a centric relation. Okay, that's the purpose of this TMJ diagram here. Is that fair enough? Perfect. Now it's important to understand that there are several movements a condyle does, and which is why we have a superior joint cavity and inferior joint cavity in the articular disc. There are also three areas of the articular disc that are important, such as posterior disc, intermediate, and anterior disc. Another very important concept of TMJ anatomy is your retrodiscal lamina. Now, over here we have muscles, we have blood supply, we have ligaments that are so much more important in controlling how far forward condyles can go. It's very important to pull it back, right? As well as muscles of mastication such as lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid. Of course, temporalis and masseter are also on that list. And composing all of that 
is our joint capsule, which in itself is a tissue of importance in today's lecture. So let's move on. What is TMJ? It's a gingly mo arthrodial joint. Yes, I know. It's just another name is gingly mo arthrodial joint. All it's trying to say is that it connects two different bones, arthrodial, in its glenoid section at superior and condyle section, the mandible at the bottom. That's how I remember it. Ginglio, mandibular, so mo, and arthrodial being the joint. Okay? It's a, in by definition, it means hinge, joint, and gliding motion. Okay? That's the representation of that entire term. And it explains everything about a TMJ. It is a hinge. Perfect. It rotates. Right? It's a joint that connects two bones. Perfect. And it glides. After rotating, it glides forward. And hence, we open the mandible and move it forward. Fair enough? Awesome. So it joints that permits both gliding and hinge movements. In other words, translation and rotation movements. How does it do that? It is when the mandibular condyle glides along the surface of glenoid fossa. And then the articular eminence slopes through the friction of articular disc. Okay, we have superior joint cavity, we have inferior joint cavity, and we'll get to know what that does in a little bit. The components, glenoid fossa, we know what that is. Articular eminence, just depicted it. Condylar head and articular disc, the friends of the joint and synovial cavities, upper and lower, very important. TMJ ligaments, all right. So there's articular capsule, basically everything that covers this area in a little ball of tissue. That's the entire articular capsule. Okay. And then we have accessory ligaments, stylomandibular, sphenomandibular. There are two ligaments that help control this area of TMJ. And how can we forget the muscles of mastication? Perfect. We've now done the anatomy in listing. Now let's talk about it in detail. Glenoid fossa. The inferior deep hollow concave surface of the temporal bone. So just this area. It harbors the mandibular condylar head, mandibular condylar head. And it permits the hinging of the condyle. So now we know one thing for sure. As soon as we hear glenoid fossa, all we're talking about is rotation. That's all. We're not talking about translation, just rotation. Right? It only has hinging. Articular eminence, it's a ramp-shaped prominence extending forward and downward from the anterior border of the glenoid fossa. Right here. Perfect. It permits protrusive movement. So now, as soon as we hear articular eminence, we're talking about translation. It's when the mandible moves forward. Condyle leaves the fossa and climbs the eminence. And articular eminence permits the lateral excursion movements. That the concept we talked about where one condyle stays in the fossa and the other side kind of moves and climbs the eminence as well. Okay, articular disc, tough, flexible, padded. It's a fibral cartilage, not high line. It's a fibral cartilage, okay? Very important exam question, guys. Articular disc, it stays between the condyle and the fossa. We know that. It's a biconcave shape, right? Right here, there's one concave and there's the other concave. Biconcave shape. Function absorbs the mandibular shocks. It's a suspension like a like a suspension in a car. The disc follows the condyle in motion, such as protrusion. So if the condyle likes to go forward, the disc will follow because it needs to protect this area of the condyle when it rubs against the slopes of the articular eminence. It's also known as the meniscus. So this disc area is also known as the meniscus. Attached at peripheries to the capsule, we know that, that the disc, this is a like a cross section, so imagine it in 3D, where this area is attached to the capsules 
at the peripheries. It divides the compartments into upper and lower synovial cavities. Now we're getting into the cavities. It contains synovial fluid. Guess what is synovial fluid's number one job? It's to lubricate the joint. It's to help with friction that can be caused when mandible moves, right? It's for lubrication. Synovial joint. Articular disc attachments. So attach firmly to the lateral and medial pole of the condyle that we know. Lateral and medial pole, again, this is a cross section. It allows for pure hinge movement using collateral ligaments attachments. Okay. So when there are collateral ligaments, they attach firmly to the lateral and medial poles of the condyle, and they allow hinge movements. Second point, attached to the back of the condyle, back of the condyle are inelastic collagen fibers, also known as retrodiscal tissues. Retrodiscal tissues, right here. These lines that we see here, these are retrodiscal tissues to prevent excessive anterior rotation of the condyle and prevent anterior displacement of the disc. And that's known as the posterior ligament. So far we've talked about two ligaments that are attached to the articular disc and they prevent two things. One, it allows a controlled hinge axis, hinge movement, and second, it prevents the condyle from going, going excessively anterior. Upper and lower synovial joint cavities. Upper is between the glenoid fossa and the upper surface of the disc, which is here. And lower is between the lower surface of the disc and the condylar head. Over here is filled with synovial fluid at where I'm drawing the stars. These are the retrodiscal tissues, the posterior ligaments. And covering this area is the TMJ capsule. And covering the head here, the attachment to the articular disc is of the collateral ligaments. Okay, that's our summary. Further moving into the ligaments, the articular capsule. It's a major, major, major ligament, right? It's the entire rim of the glenoid fossa and articular ligaments covers the whole joint space. Over the entire TMJ, condylar head, inside the glenoid fossa, everything. It attaches to the edges of the articular disc. And the function is to hold the disc in place between the condyle and fossa. So it's like a blanket, blanket of tissue covering the entire condyle. It prevents two things. It prevents dislocation of the mandible, beautiful. And it prevents extreme excursion. So basically controls movements that can harm the joint. This here is the joint capsule. Imagine that the condyle actually fits right here, right? So it covers the whole condyle. Accessory ligaments. There are more ligaments to talk about. Again, hopefully when you're making notes, guys, we want to follow the same strategy that we're digging from a bottleneck approach. So we talked about overall TMJ and the gingliomoarthrodial joint, and now we're moving all the way down to each and every ligament, and we cross all different anatomies as we dug deeper. Perfect. Bottleneck approach, guys. So accessory TMJ ligament, stylomandibular, sphenomandibular. Stylomandibular ligament origins at the styloid process. Surprise, surprise. And styloid process is where? It's at the temporal bone. Insertion, posterior border of ramus near the angle of the mandible. Ramus, angle of the mandible, posterior side. What's its function? Prevents excessive protrusion. When mandible moves forward, it kind of pulls it back and they go, okay, no, 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 let's not go too far, right? Let's stay in style. So, stylomandibular. Terrible joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, this is the mass, the styloid process, sorry. Okay, and this is stylomandibular ligament. Is that perfect? Styloid? Sphenomandibular ligament. The origin is at the spine of the sphenoid bone. Sphenol, sphenoid bone. 
insertion lingual of the mandible. Lingual of the mandible is actually in the middle section of the ramus, right here, very close to the mandibular foramen. The function is to prevent excessive descent inferiorly. You can now guess that when mandible tries to move down, this ligament says, whoop, let's keep back, let's get back to the sphenoid bone, which is here. Perfect, so two very important accessory ligaments, origin, insertion, and function. Okay, let's talk about TMJ in dynamics. So we talked about it in a static position, right? The anatomy of it. But let's talk about dynamics, how it acts when it opens, when it opens maximum, when it closes and when it's completely closed. So in opening, there's a combination of rotation and translation involved of the condyle, the forward and the downward movement of the mandible, the disc located most anterior and superior position at the centric relation. However, during opening, the disc moves to the top of the condyle's head. It initiated by inferior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. So much information packed into these points, guys. It is the muscle that pulls the condyle forward and the disc along with it. The condyle climbs down the slope of the eminence, and voila, we have an open mouth. So, what does all of that mean? Now, I'm, I know I'm taking your time doing this, but this is very basic and very important. Take a look at this. This is rest position. It is completely centric related. It is condyle movement. It has nothing to do with teeth. It is when the articular disc is at the most superior anterior position of the condyle or head. But what if the lateral pterygoid goes, uh-oh, I'm going to move it. I'm going to move this muscle forward. But lateral pterygoid has two heads. It will also move the disc with it. When the condyle is moved forward, so is the disc with it. And see how this got squeezed? The avascular portion got squeezed it's because all the pressure is now building up right here. And see how this space, which is the retrodiscal space here, has now widened up as compared to here. Okay, keep that in mind. This is very important. Moving on, the Condyle is out of the glenoid fossa and now at the articular eminence crest and the disc followed with it. Maximum opening, the condyle reaches the crest of the articular eminence and the disc follows it to the crest. The disc is now located between the condyle and the articular eminence. So far, what we know is that maximum opening, the articular disc has followed the condyle down the slope to the crest of the articular eminence. Okay, and the disc is located in between, but the disc begins to rotate backwards due to the posterior ligament, guys. See right here, this ligament right here says, okay, articular disc, that's too far, let's bring the condyle back. So it says this is the maximum opening area, dictated by posterior ligament. And in response to that, the superior head of the lateral pterygoid releases its action. Superior head of the lateral pterygoid, right here, releases its action and says, okay, I won't pull you any more forward, okay? I'm going to stay where I am. That's the superior head. Closing. The condyle now climbs back up the steep eminence towards the fossa. The disc, of course, follows the condyle from the front of the condyle or at the crest of the condyle to the anterior superior position at the condyle. Reminds us of the centric relation definition, guys. Now the superior head of the lateral pterygoid is contracting its action. It's saying, okay, let me help you push you back. Let me help you push it back. So this is the mouth close as rest position. This is what we need. However, when it is opened widely, how do we get back? Well, we get back by saying, okay, lateral pterygoid, superior head, push back. Superior head, push back. That's the superior head contracting. Well, the inferior head releases. Inferior head says, okay, I'm going to let loose. Okay, I'm going to let loose now. I'm going to let you push back. Where the posterior discal tissues, the posterior ligament, pulls the articular disc back in action, taking the condyle with it. Fair enough? The inferior head is now releasing his action. And slowly but surely, the condyle moved from here to here through the action of the in lateral pterygoid muscle 
and the posterior ligament. At completely closed, the condyle reaches the centric relation, right here, where the posterior ligament has pulled the disc as far back as possible, and now there is no more space for the posterior ligaments to act at all. So the articular disc has now returned at the superior anterior position of the condyle head as well. Now, we kept talking about the posterior ligament, right? So much of the retrodiscal tissues. Well, what is it? Let's talk about it. Retrodiscal tissues in space. The space created between condyle and posterior ligament is called retrodiscal space. Okay, so what is that? There is condyle, there is articular disc, there is superior head of lateral pterygoid, inferior head of lateral pterygoid. Well, then, what is this tissue? That is the posterior ligament. However, if you notice something very, very close, there is a void of space right here. That, ladies and gentlemen, is retrodiscal space. It is a network of blood vessels that are walled by elastic fibers. So, yes, when this mandible tends to move, this space is created. All of these voids are composed of blood vessels. So, this part of the TMJ is vascular. As the condyles glide forward and downward, the space expands and the blood flows inside very smoothly. As the condyles move back into the centric relation, so as this gap narrows and now is completely closed, the space is contracted and the blood retreats back into the vessels and does not flow. This is known as shunting system or a vascular knee. Very important exam question. Whenever the retrodiscal tissue is contracted, so there is no blood here. This is known as vascular knee or shunting system. When it's wide open, that's when blood flows in the retrodiscal tissues. Fair enough? Perfect. Now, TMJ out of the way, guys. Let's move into the mandibular movements. We now understand the anatomy, which is why the following lecture series the slides will be so much easier to understand. Mandibular movements overview. The condylar path, the path on which the condyle walks, is either basic, excursive, or in border movements, and then further defined into functional and parafunctional. What happens in basic? Well, we already looked at it. Rotation happens and translation happens. Guess what that does? It opens and closes. Excursive? opens and closes for sure, as well as protrusion, retrusion, so forward and backward, as well as lateral, which is side by side. Border movements, it is the furthest outside movement of the mandible without causing any damage to the tissues. It is seen in three different planes, sagittal, frontal, and horizontal, and we'll discuss this in the Pozelt's envelope in detail. Functional movements, we got chewing, swallowing speech, yawning, and spatial expressions. Mandible is very important in functional movements, as well as parafunctional. Bruxism, clenching, and oral habits. Important concepts in the following slides include Bennett angle, Bennett movement, Pozelt's envelope, and of course the working and non-working side. Okay, mandible movements, basic movements. Rotation, it's the hinge movements. Initial. 12 millimeters of the movement is pure rotation. Let's write that down very bold. Pure rotation, when condyles move without any translation, within the glenoid fossa entirely, not articular eminence. Remember, guys, we talked about this in detail in previous slides. Rotation happens inside the inferior joint cavity, the lower compartment only. The three axes that can perform rotation are horizontal in opening and closing, right? So this is opening and closing. This is the introductory photograph we saw. Horizontal axis, where it opens and closes. Frontal, which is looking at it from the front as it rotates side to side. 
right? So it moves lateral, but lateral rotation only. And look how, guys, that since it shows moving the mandible to this direction, the working axis is placed on the working side as pure rotation, right? Pure rotation. Whereas the non-working side will always rotate as well as move a little bit forward as well. And then comes the sagittal, which is the lateral, where it moves as it opens downwards. So inferior movement of the non-working side, where this sagittal plane represents, or the axis represents, a rotation with working side rotating only and non-working side going inferior. Remember that ligament that prevents inferior movements, the sphenomandibular ligament? That's where it's useful. Perfect. And then, of course, the same uh, planes are used to see the rotation, horizontal, frontal, and sagittal. That's the difference, it's horizontal, frontal, and sagittal. And just to be kind of thorough, so we're clear on this concept, so, uh, the horizontal is when you're looking at it from the front and you see a rod running horizontally between two condyles. That's the horizontal axis. The only way a mandible can move on that is imagine, imagine attaching a hanger of clothes on it. All it will do is rotate, right? That's it, opens and closes, horizontal axis. Whereas a frontal axis is you're still looking at it from the front, but the axis is vertical, not horizontal. It's vertical. And what will that do? It'll move the mandible laterally. Left or right, left or right. Okay, that's frontal axis. And sagittal axis is you're still looking at it from the front, but you'll only see a point. You know why? Because that point moves right through anterior posteriorly. And what does a mandible do? Imagine a mandible hanging off of a rod like this. It will swivel, right? As it goes downwards here and upwards here. It swivels, and that's sagittal. Hopefully those terminologies are clear, guys. Okay, so just to explain the difference between the words axis and plane, we know what horizontal axis does now. It opens and closes the mandible using how the red arrows show us, okay? However, where do you view this? You view this in the sagittal plane. So sagittal is what? Up to down, top to bottom. That's the sagittal plane. You can view that rotation in this plane where the two condyles will end up rotating to open and close the mandible. Fair enough? That's the sagittal plane. Horizontal plane, on the other hand, is where you'll see frontal axis move left to right. This, act, this plane right here, the horizontal plane, it will turn the mandible to the left or right. Well, what will it do it on? It will do it on the frontal axis. That's a terrible axis, guys. <laughs> it will do it on the frontal axis. Moves left or right, depending on the rotation of the axis at the moment. But it's viewed on horizontal planes. And last but not the least, the sagittal axis, the sagittal axis is viewed in the coronal plane. What's coronal? Where, where you can see the crown. That's what it means, the crown, the front and back of the head. How do you see it? Well, imagine the mandible right here, and it moves up or down. Rotation in the sagittal axis, axis can be viewed in frontal or coronal plane. Coronal plane divides the face into anterior and posterior part. That's the plane. Okay, translation, the gliding movement. So we talked about rotation so far on three axes, viewing it on three planes. Now let's talk about what follows when the mouth opens. It's the translation, also a part of basic movements, the sliding or gliding motion of both the condyles together, downwards and forwards motion of the condyle outside of the glenoid fossa, climbing the eminence. It occurs during excursive movements of the mandible, such as opening and closing. Translation happens in the superior joint cavity, not the inferior, because inferior is rotation. And the upper compartment, the superior joint cavity, is translation. So 
over here, it has now left the glenoid fossa and condyle is now attaching to the articular eminence slopes as it glides out of the fossa and down while opening. Superior retrodiscal lamina is stretched back right here and the intermediate region is pulled forwards as the condyle is left by glenoid fossa as it moves downwards. Perfect, so here's another diagram. The collateral ligament, which is attaching the articular disc with the condyle, holds this motion together during rotation. It prevents it from escaping. And in translation, as you notice, the condyle has moved its position outside of the glenoid fossa where in rotation it was within the glenoid fossa itself. Fair enough? That's translation. These are the combinations of rotation and translations, either unilateral or bilateral. And now we're talking about excursive. Opening and closing movements is considered basically a forward and downward movement from the centripulation. Initial 12 millimeters is pure rotation. Posterior border movements, that's what we call it. Posterior border movements is pure rotation of 12 millimeters. Later, it, it has a translatory movement until maximum opening. Reverse is true for closing the mouth as well. It's viewed in sagittal plane. Okay. Opening and movements begin from CR showing position of the condyle during CR. Right here. Centripulation. Condyle within the fossa and articular disc must be right here where it's shaded fair enough centric occlusion and centric relation are so close in dentate patients not edentulous in dentate patients very close right can you notice that the centric occlusion is about two millimeters ahead of centric relation just a little bit ahead well that's the beauty of centric relation it's slightly retruded the most posterior position of the mandible, even further back than centric occlusion. And then for 12 millimeters of the opening from CR to B, there is only a hinge and rotation movement of the condyle. So still within the glenoid fossa, still within it as it rotates. And as you can see that the CR has now moved to B, position B. Okay. Now, showing the position of the condyle after maximum opening and translation that occurs by E. Okay, the glenoid fossa is now vacant. Condyle moves down the articular eminence at the crest of the articular eminence, and the centric relation and position B is left behind as position E approaches. So, what happened? We got centric occlusion, centric relation position B and position E. Fair enough? That's basically our border movement, right? In, in essence, that's the border movement. Moving on to more excursive movements, protrusion and retrusion. Okay, very interesting. A forward movement of the mandible from centric relation is known as protrusion. Retrusion is the exact opposite of the above process. Well, what process? Think of it this way. The condyle moves forward and downwards. It is dictated by the contours of the glenoid fossa, which is not in a straight line. Right? The condyle follows down and moves forward and downwards like that, from the glenoid fossa to the articular eminence. Whereas retrusion is the exact opposite. In dentate patients, very important point, incisal edge-to-edge -edge demarcates protrusion. Okay? Protrusion is demarcated by edge-to-edge. -edge. But what happens when there is edge-to-edge -edge contact of the anterior teeth in dentate patients? We have Christensen's phenomena. Remember, Christensen's phenomena, dentate patients. Very, I keep saying this again and again, guys, because it's a very important question in the exams as well. So when protrusive edge-to-edge -edge occurs in dentate patients, the posterior must disocclude. Notice the gap here. This is essence of mutual protection. This is natural. 
our natural dentition is built in with this software that lets there be some space in the posterior teeth when there is contact in the anterior teeth. And that we call as Christensen's phenomenon. But in edentulous patients, this gap in the posterior must be compensated by balanced occlusion. Because what we want is to allow denture stability. Now, imagine this. Let me erase this off the screen. And you'll notice, if there is a complete denture, if this entire thing was a complete denture, and if there was a contact in the protrusive area, do you think these denture bases would kind of move up here and these move down here from the alveolar ridge? Well, that causes instability. And therefore, we need posterior teeth to contact in anterior and posterior locations as well. We call that a balanced occlusion. Remember, that's for edentulous patients, not dentate patients. The angle formed by the advancing condyles and the frontal plane is called condylar guidance. Okay, what does that mean? Now, condyle moves forward like that. The frontal plane. Now, this frontal plane and the condylar path creates an angle right here. And that angle is what we call as condylar guidance. Okay, so this diagram represents position F. Now remember so far what we had, we had centric occlusion, then we had centric relation a little bit behind it, then we had opening of B, and maximum opening at E, and now we have protrusion at F, right? So what do we have? A movement like that, right? Protrusive movement that brings the anterior teeth edge to edge. That's protrusion. This is protrusion. However, maximum protrusion, which is letter F, maximum protrusion. That brings the condyle at its maximum movement dictated by the contours of the glenoid fossa. This is as far as it would go when it's trying to move forward. However, this is in its glenoid fossa only up to edge to edge, okay? Protrusive condylar guidance, angle and inclination. Okay, very important concept. This, is, this line here is now dictating the path of the condyle. Okay, so path of the condyle on the glenoid fossa. Fair enough, so far okay? That's what happens in protrusive movements. But if you notice how, for example, if this is the glenoid fossa, and this is the articular eminence crest, right? This condyle tends to move, rotate in the fossa, down the articular eminence, at the crest of the articular eminence. This is the regular movement of the condyle. But this condyle or pathway, which is represented by the green line, intersects with what we know as Frankfurt horizontal plane. For this lecture here, we need to understand that the Frankfurt horizontal plane intersects with the condylar pathway, and that we call as condylar guidance angle. Just here. Okay, so basically like that and like that. Right here, this angle. That is condylar angle. Mandibular movements, excursive movements lateral parts of those movements, the side-to-side -side movements, the working side, the non-working side. It's also known as the functional side, the side to which the mandible will move. The working or the rotating are terminologies adapted to the word condyle when we're talking about the condyles located on the side of the movement. It only rotates on its axis and moves outward laterally. So the working side condyle will only rotate and moves outwards laterally. This is known as lateral trusion. Okay, very, very important word. The working side lateral movement is known as lateral trusion. This is where the Bennett movement or Bennett shift occurs. However, the non-working side is known as the balancing side, right? We need something to balance the working side, which is the non-working side, also known as the, well, the other side, I like to call it, 
the non-working or orbiting condyles are part of the other side. Those are the two terminologies. It translates and rotates. And we've talked about this in lots of depth, you guys. As it moves inwards towards the center of the face. And we'll take a look at the image as well, so don't worry. This is known as mediotrusion. Why mediotrusion? Because it's not moving laterally, it's moving medially. It's a non working side. And it forms the Bennett's angle or lateral condylar guidance angle. And it ranges from 2 to 44 degrees, and the mean is at 16 degrees. It's just a fact to remember. Here's the picture, and this is what we started with. Okay, mandible is moving to this side. This is the left side of the mandible. Fair enough? Okay. The right side is this side. That essentially makes the left side the working side, the right side, non working side. That would make this condyle the orbiting condyle, and this condyle the working condyle. Fair enough? All the terminology is cleared so far? Perfect. So left, working. Right, non-working. Okay, so the working condyle on this side, it rotates, right? It rotates. It wants to turn because it needs to move the mandible to this side. It's the closest to the movement side. However, the non-working side condyle, it not only rotates, but it actually translates towards the middle of the mandible as well. That's why this area is known as mediotrusive and this is known as lateral trusive. Okay, so translation plus rotation, only rotation. Fair enough? Now, this of course is known as the Bennett movement, Bennett movement, and because it not only rotates but also translates, it forms. Two angles and that angle is known as the Bennett angle is that perfect awesome so Bennett angle Bennett movement in more detail when the mandible is moved to the right the right side of the condyle becomes a working condyle and the opposite condyle works as non-working condyle the working condyle rotates with or without lateral shift which is known as a Bennett shift from centric relation, while the non-working condyle translates forward, downward, medial, from CR to A. Okay, what does that mean? This mandible, this is, we're looking at it from the front, okay? We're looking at it from the front, incisors are right here. Okay, this mandible wants to move to its right-hand side on this side. This is centric relation of the condyle, as it moves in the excursive movements towards the right side, the working condyle will rotate. It'll rotate. And this we call as Bennett movement towards point B. But the centric relation to point A's journey at the non-working side is determined by two motions, guys. Rotation and translation. And that essentially forms an angle, Bennett angle. I know I've repeatedly explained this, guys, but this is such an extremely important point in prosthodontics that not only exams, but when you're out in the field creating dentures or uh, fabricating FPDs, this is extremely important to maintain. Another way to look at it is Bennett angle formed by the average pathway of the balancing condyle, which is non-working. So average pathway is represented by this light blue line, which is a straight line, straight line. With the sagittal plane, when the lateral movement is made. So sagittal plane, what was sagittal plane? Remember the vertical plane of looking at it? With average pathway, that angle, the blue lines right here, guys. Now I've colored them in red. The sagittal plane and the average pathway can also make an angle known as Bennett angle. It's a balancing condylar pathway that moves within that angle, starts here, and moves forward and downwards and rotates. Okay, speaking of border movements, 
the general information is that it's limited by nerves, muscles, and ligaments, right? A mandible is bounded in all directions by either nerves, muscles, or ligaments. It's recorded in three anatomical planes, right? Sagittal, frontal, horizontal that we looked at. With a device known as pantograph. This device here, very complicated but very, very useful, is called pantograph. It records the border movements of a mandible. It's constantly repeatable positions and movements of the mandible that allows us to know how far a individual's mandible can move. And it creates a beautiful shape, a shield-like shape, like this one. It's used extensively in recording jaw relations, so we'll discuss them much more in jaw relation lectures. It's both functional and parafunctional movements that occur in the borders of the mandible. The concept in this is posel envelope, such as this one. So if you think about it this way, the centric relation is the most retruded position, the most posterior position the mandible can go. After which, the mandible goes into centric occlusion, moves forward into the edge to edge relation, and then of course the protrusion kicks in. And afterwards, there's maximum opening of the entire oral cavity. Right? That's this is all condylar movement trajectory. And of course, there is a start of the translation here towards going to the maximum opening. So, how all of this is recorded? Let's take a look at it. Okay, let's talk about this entire concept of the Pozelt's envelope and its its recordings in border movements in detail. It's the movement of the mandible from centric occlusion, which is this area here, to maximal protrusion, which is F. And then it moves to maximum opening as it moves downwards, as the mandible moves downwards. Then it closes through translation only, which is until position B. And then finally through closing with rotation, which is B back to the centric occlusion and resting back at centric occlusion. That entire movement is borders. Our entire chewing, swallowing, speaking, all of that happens within this entire shield of mandibular movements. Fair enough? Awesome. This is another diagram in sagittal plane as well. Maximum intercuspation, centric occlusion right here. This is centric relation retruded, right? So it goes to edge to edge, and then to maximum protrusion, which is F, moves down all the way, opens the mouth, maximum opening, and back in E to B, which is your translation while closing, and then B, back to centric occlusion and centric relation, which is CRB, is true hinge axis, which is rotation closing the mandible. Perfect. This is in different planes right here. Same thing represented in different planes. So in horizontal plane, movements of the mandible from centric relation to the right and the left extremes is recorded. There's lateral trusion of one condyle and medial trusion of the other. We discussed that a couple of slides ago, guys. The recording is important at centric, right? So imagine this, this is your centric relation. In horizontal plane, what is the recording gonna show? is going to show F, which is maximum protrusion, right? Maximum protrusion, whereas it's maximum left and maximum right. This is medial lateral movements, right? Maximum left, maximum right, protrusion, and centric relation. So you're looking at it from the top down. Frontal plane, mandible from centric right and left extremes to maximum opening, and then back to CR. Okay, maximum intercuspation position. This is maximum intercuspation, centric occlusion, and a little bit behind it, you'll notice it's centric relation. Fair enough? So from here, we can trace that it goes maximum to the left, maximum to the right, as well as how much it takes for it to open the mouth fully. See how while opening, there's a little bit of a curve in the condylar path? Well, that's because in maximum opening, we need both translation and rotation, translation and rotation in both. Otherwise, for example, here in maximum protrusion, all we need is translation. Right, straight down, maximum protrusion. Remember, 
from going from protrusion to maximum opening right here protrusion to maximum opening there's another curve and that curve represents translation along with rotation so what do we learn from that concept is that every time there is a curve in the movement of the mandible there is a translation and rotation involved as soon as there is just a straight line straight line for example even in here if there is a straight line access that is when there is only translation required okay write that point down in the and star it guys it's very important and when we compare all three of these planes together we form envelope of motion it's a 3d combo of all border movements from the other slides also known as Pozel's envelope so we've already talked about this how e is maximum opening f is maximum protrusion c is maximum retrusion whereas mip is maximum intercuspation and b is the intermediate point so remember this whole thing is closing the mouth whereas this is closing by translation this is closing by rotation and then we looked at the side by side view where it's maximum right side maximum left side right and its relation to maximum protrusion and its relation to maximum opening and so on and forth in any sense Pozel's envelope gives us dimensions protrusion maximum of 9 to 10 millimeters that's the protrusive dimension so let me erase this to show you guys better protrusion is 9 to 10 millimeters this is up to 9 to 10 millimeters opening is 50 to 60 millimeters downwards 50 to 60 millimeters downwards lateral protrusion is 10 millimeters on each side lateral protrusion is 10 millimeters on each side and retrusion is one millimeter posteriorly. One millimeter posteriorly. This is Pozel's envelope. Another diagram for you guys to practice on that remember this was nine to 10 millimeters. This was supposed to be 50 to 60 millimeters. This is supposed to be one to two millimeters. Uh, medial and lateral positions on each side are going to be 10 millimeters, right? Just presenting it in a different schematic diagram that you may see. Now, remember the letters that we talked about? E is now replaced with T here. B is replaced with R. F is replaced with uh, PR. That's okay. As long as we have this entire shape in mind and we could draw this in, the, in our practice or during our study time, then these can be interchangeable and it won't matter to you because we know how much dimension where we, what's located this is edge to edge this is maximum opening because we learned so much in illustrations in the past slides all of this should be okay like for example this is maximum opening and this is closing through translation and this is closing through rotation so that concept is what's important you guys last but not the least the two slides that are left are functional movements which is chewing swallowing speaking and yawning it takes place within the envelope itself. This is the depiction of how it looks like. Chewing appears as a teardrop. Okay, so let me erase this here. Uh, chewing appears as teardrop, whereas in the cycle is preparatory phase, food contact phase, crushing phase, tooth contact phase, and grinding phase, and then centric occlusion phase. It's just how we chew. Not very important, but it's a part of the lecture, so that's why we included it. Swallowing and Deglutition is when the mandible is stabilized against the maxilla and the contraction of the masseter and temporalis muscles occur. Basically, the upper and the lower teeth contact in clenching touch, and then it's used to verify centric jaw relation as the mandible tends to move to CR. So, swallowing is what? It creates negative pressure, it creates a vacuum inside the oral cavity. Right? In that case, the condyle is meant to go all the way back to CR. CR. When that happens, we record centric jaw relation. And that's why swallowing is important during our centric jaw relation recording. We'll talk about it in our lecture too, 
how to record jaw relations. And then speaking. Of course, phonation is variable, but the interest is in the teeth setting procedure because teeth and their fricative sounds and their closest speaking space and so on is another lecture to discuss on as well. These are the muscles of mastication. Of course, our anatomy series will be covering them in detail, but we know that muscles of mastication and suprahyoid muscles include masseter temporalis, medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid, and suprahyoid muscles as well. Uh, the mandibular movements associated with each muscle is opening and retrusion by masseter. So this is the green here is masseter on the outside of the mandible, the lateral surface of the ramus of the mandible. What it does is it helps retrude the mandible as well as closing it. The temporalis muscle, elevation and retrusion, it elevates the mandible and it retrudes the mandible. That's the fan-shaped muscle attached at the coronoid process. The condyle is over here, you guys. And then medial pterygoid, which is closing and lateral movement. So medial pterygoid is basically this one here, where it's attached to the inside, opposing a mirror image to the masseter muscle. And its job is to do closing and lateral movements on the other side as it closes and kind of pulls the mandible that way. Lateral pterygoid is opening, protrusion, and lateral movement. See how many movements that did? And which is why we talked about it today, including its superior head and inferior head, as it protrudes the mandible, as well as working in lateral movements side by side. And it opens the mandible downwards as well as it moves downwards. And then come the suprahyoid group of muscles, which help depress. Remember, suprahyoid is basically muscle, so this is a hyoid bone, by example, and any muscle above it is known as suprahyoid, and it helps depress the mandible. It helps depress the mandible, pulls the mandible down, suprahyoid muscle. Fair enough? Okay, so golden rules of occlusion. We got various rules of occlusion that kind of help you understand different types of occlusion in a summary. So bilateral, even contact, as soon as we see this, we think of CD. We've already talked about this in our previous lecture in complete denture occlusal schemes. It provides even load distribution on both sides of the arch and prevents the tipping forces of the denture base. Next comes anterior and canine guidance. This is for dentate patients, right? Posterior teeth disocclude when doing lateral and protrusive movements. This is known as canine guidance, mutually protected, and so on and forth. What does it do? It helps reduce forces placed on the muscles of mastication when only the anterior teeth are engaged. Anterior teeth are skinny, they're, they're tiny as compared to the molars. They can't be given too much force, so we have to use Christensen's phenomena in dentate patients to reduce the forces. Same thing can be aided by bilateral balance occlusion in complete denture patients. The yellow is important here, is used in replacement of bilateral balance occlusion when it cannot be achieved. Canine guidance is more expensive and technique sensitive to achieve, but it's the second best in the market. Some references suggest that canine guided can only be used in dentate patients and not for CD, so it's a very controversial point. But just to be safe, bilateral balanced occlusion is for CD, canine guided occlusion is for dentate. And of course, we don't want any interferences on the movements. We want unobstructed envelope of function so that our muscles of mastication are relaxed, the function remains unhindered, and of course, tipping forces of the denture base are away as well. And this is our next lecture on interferences. So stay tuned for that as well, you guys. Perfect. These are our references for today's lecture. The two textbooks in the article are in the links below for you to see as well. Please feel free to visit those websites. And thank you so much, my tooth doctors and doctresses, for a jaw-dropping 6,000-plus subscriber. See how I said jaw-dropping because we were just talking about maximum opening. Okay, another terrible joke, but you support us, and it means the world to us. And we will continue to deliver such amazing lectures to keep dentistry flourishing. We deeply appreciate it. A message from Dr. Kanan Shah and myself, Dr. Rishi Shah. Thank you for everything you've done for us in supporting in the growth of our channel. Thank you for watching.
like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned.